Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. I am currently in Almaty, Kazakhstan. I've arrived a few nights ago and I am still recovering from my jet lag. So I thought why not film a Q&A video. This is something slightly nerve-wracking for me, if I'm being honest, because it's like opening up myself more to the public audience. But I think my aim and intention for this video is to genuinely connect with you and to let you know what life is like behind the scene and a bit more about me. There are so many great questions that you posted and I cannot answer them all. So I've summarized and selected a few that would sort of gather this uh, all together and hopefully this is something that you've been wondering about. <laughs> or if not, that's fine. You can watch the next travel video. So anyway, I would like to start with three easy questions. First, from Roshan asking, are you okay? Thank you, I am very well. Um, generally, it's always been like ups and downs, but I am in a much better place. How many years of traveling from nm underscore sadik so i've traveled alone since 2013 the first time since then actually that was what 10 years ago now as of filming this is 2023 uh, that's a decade <laughs> that's insane isn't it but yeah i think i've started traveling alone in that year and continuously building up my experiences because I was craving for more experiences and travel exposure and then here you are 10 years later who would have thought do I really travel alone I am a guy but afraid to travel alone from knowledge is life so I think if I'm being honest traveling alone itself is not for everyone it could be daunting um, but I would say that you should start small if you want to try. You should start somewhere closer to home. You should start somewhere that is not very far away from where you are from. And you can start by doing weekend trips or a couple of night trips in between. And I think with this, you have to like build up this confidence. Right now, I must say it's a skill that I've gathered over the years. But at the same time, it's not that I would never be scared of, you know, doing things alone. And yes, I actually travel alone. Sorry, I actually forgot the actual question. I actually am travel alone, traveling alone, and I travel alone 98% most of my time. Um, the rest are mostly potentially with my husband or in the past travel partner, but 98% yeah definitely it's a lot easier for me coming from Puspa, Suruchi and Doti and they are similar questions about finding courage or how to overcome fear at the initial stage of traveling I think with myself I've I didn't think that it was simply overcoming fear it was mostly my strong desire to see different parts of the world and i knew that i needed to take a small step the first step a stepping stone basically and i went to singapore which is a very nearby country to indonesia where i'm originally from and therefore that was my very first step to build my confidence and it's interesting to look at this into two different perspectives. If you focus on this idea of solo traveling and what makes you fear about that, I think your mindset is simply stuck into thinking about all these things that could happen. However, if you, if you try to break down that big goal into small things, small steps that is possible for you to do, you'll find little courage within yourself to tackle that first step and then you build that confidence. And I think courage is there when the fear still exists, uh, but you try to overcome that little and, you know, slowly in your own way. From a friend of mine here on YouTube, Alina McLeod, she asked, what would you say has been your most challenging trip? 
I've thought long and hard about this and I think there are several incidents of course throughout my time that is very challenging and difficult to overcome mentally, physically. But I think I would like to categorize that into travel experiences per se, um, visa-wise per se, and dealing with government per se. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. Because I think um, there are certain situations where the traveling itself is so easy, but dealing with the government or overcoming the red tape was a bit more challenging so I would say the first being Belarus because traveling in Belarus was fairly easy extremely pleasant but I got my drone confiscated there even to a point where I was sitting in a police police office for hours and hours not knowing what it would be like, what the situation was like, uh, what, should I, what should I do? And I even had to attend to a Ministry of Aviation, um, answering questions and answers. Um, yeah, so many things. And passing through the immigration of uh, Belarusian immigration, I remembered it was just so very long because <laughs> the officer was taking so much time looking at my passport, like flicking through, trying to like find some mistaken information and like zoom in and every little details that's fine actually uh, so that was really di difficult for me to have lost my drone that was really expensive um, it took me two weeks to recover mentally and thinking that i should still proceed with this journey the second being the most difficult in terms of dealing with paperwork or like visa situation I think so far, obviously, moving to the UK has been one of the, the most difficult visa situation we've had to deal with. Um, we, as in my husband and I, Dave, we've submitted over 500 pages just to fulfill this requirement um, to sort of prove that we are a genuine person and we have a genuine continuing relationship. This is just to get a fiancé visa, by the way, not a spouse visa. And in terms of travel experiences, I think the hardest would be, I would say Albania. There's one moment, not Albania in general, because it was very pleasant, but in one moment where I was riding my scooter and it was getting very late and I didn't expect there was a seven or eight kilometers of unpaved road. Unpaved road is fine, but the problem with this is that it was really behind mountains and the scooter was not meant for that. And I didn't know this unpaved road exists. Um, and also the stones the rocks are so massive that it was very challenging for me to ride that and i think at this point there was no signal and i started to think that there is no any other way but to push through because there is no one literally in my surrounding no locals whatsoever and i could not get any help rather than other than pushing myself up to reach the guest house that I found on booking.com. And thankfully I did manage that. And I was so relieved and ex extremely exhausted the next day, obviously emotionally and physically, but I had to persevere and think that I, instead of thinking, moving forward with my next journey, I should just stay in and focus with my surrounding and film that experience. And I think the video itself turned out to be great. So, so far, yeah, those are the most challenging ones that I can think of. Perhaps I'm sure there will be so many more, uh, but what, what, what's that saying? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> I'm sure Alina, as a YouTuber herself, um, she has experienced so many interesting things along the way. But uh, thanks so much for asking. Next question comes from Agus. He asks, why did you visit the countryside, which is uncommon for travelers? So I think personally, I am an introvert traveler. I can be extroverted, of course, in certain circumstances 
but generally solo traveling is my way of flourishing being an ex introverted personality and even being in a city it's good but in a way that with filming i get very you know nervous stage fright lots of people uh, but more importantly i think in the countryside uh, where it's not generally a tourist destination you'll easily find normal people to have interaction with um, to share this understanding or just have a glimpse into people's life really um, into the local ways of local ways of life um, local culture that sometimes you cannot get from a city alone and yeah and it's just something that I like finding that solitude the next question comes from Helena. Have you ever felt scared and safe? Have you ever felt like giving up and just leave and go home? Obviously, of course, I think it's unnatural to say no to that. Um, I think the times where I really wanted to go home is usually the first few days or just the first few weeks arriving in a new country and feeling like oh, very unsettled wanting to be with my husband or wanting to be in a place where I feel familiar but at the same time I think this is a natural process of um, feeling of being in an uncomfortable situation or in a new environment um, with the language that you don't speak, new faces, new people, culture and so forth. And if you sit with that feeling, I think it will pass. But also at the same time, if there are things when I feel so dangerous and I have to leave, of course I would do that. Um, sometimes I think this the hardest part is finding that strength within yourself and overcoming that feeling because sometimes leaving is not always the best decision for me personally because I think like when I'm set into this mindset of wanting to finish something um, the desire is there and the motivation is up and down of course the journey is never going to be linear but when I'm down I will take some time to take care of myself um, which I sometimes still find it hard to do, not to beat myself up for feeling like that, and then how to overcome that feeling and then take a little step again, each step push you forward. Um, so yeah, I don't think in terms of feeling unsafe, there are minor things here and there, but I usually try to avoid that by, you know, not really going out at night. I'm not really putting myself in danger that I feel like I've pushed myself too hard so I think I try to avoid that but thankfully with in terms of giving up and try to leave home I have always been in touch and in a video chat with my husband <laughs> which has been the greatest strength and support um, and you don't feel so lonely but if you don't have that I mean, prior to our relationship, obviously, I didn't have anyone. You have to be feeling comfortable with yourself. And I think that is something that you need to develop. The next one from Marcus. Hi, Shifa, how do you overcome the loneliness and fear, if any, as a female traveler? The loneliness, I think... With solo traveling, I think there is two ways of thinking about it first being actually alone and second being lonely just because you're alone doesn't mean that you're lonely the loneliness is natural process of being right especially if you're so used to living surrounded by so many people if you're used to living in a city and you're not very comfortable sitting with your own thoughts and feeling that's the feeling of loneliness sometimes you feel like oh my god how am I going to overcome this uncomfortable situation? But usually the first step, what I would do when I'm in that, in that mood is that go out of the room, go out of the place that I am staying at and just walk um, and, and smile to a local that you meet. It usually helps to break down that you know, fear or just like this internal struggle uh, that I have. I know it's not a grand thing. I think it's like 
I always go back to the idea of taking a small step and finding a little comfort here and there and talk myself into it and let the thought pass and ask yourself why are you feeling like this uh, and I think having conversations with myself is something that I've developed over the years and trying to understand where this feeling stems from rather than react to it um, at the time that I feel like that I will sit with it and sometimes and oftentimes journal that feeling it helps and also talk about that feeling so talk about that and also if you can find other travelers um, to talk through or have a video chat with people at home um, friends families and whatnot um, and find comfort in the routine that you have I usually set a routine to help me get through the day the next two questions comes from Patreon. So if you don't know, I have a Patreon account. These are a more intimate community. And for those who want to support my work, for those who want to support my journey, and also where I actually share a lot more personally uh, with regards to family, with regards to behind the scene with work, behind the scene with this travel, um, you are welcome to join um, the link is in the description box down below anyway sorry i don't sin I, I don't <laughs> oh my god i don't think i can talk today but anyway let's move forward uh from ken how do you define identity after being frequently exposed to a variety of cultures does it amplify your senses of indonesianness or this idea of belonging to a certain nation or ethnic ethnic group no longer befits how you see yourself so I think I personally never feel that connected to Indonesia as a country, like not to disrespect to any Indonesian. It's just a feeling I've always had, uh, remember growing up and it's not like I, I hate the country where I was born. It was just a feeling of, no, this is not where I'm supposed to be. And this is not where I feel belong. And I, I think that's a completely fine feeling. So therefore with traveling, it helps me to neutralize that feeling a lot more because I think um, I've met a lot, dif a lot of different cultures and people and having conversations with especially travelers who also have this kind of feeling made me realize that, oh, it's not an exclusive feeling alone to me. And therefore it normalized my mindset it allows me to think that uh, that's okay to feel like that um, and it helps me so much with my travel uh, now that I'm not so you know I don't really identify myself to be a particular this person particular that you know I think it's just a neutral identity that helps a lot in the way that I travel <laughs> am I rumbling uh, probably but the next question comes from Indira and also there's a question from Mark that asks similar questions about being married and also how is that that moving to the UK, how has marriage changed uh, my view of life and travel. I think it's it's interesting because I love I love my time and staying and living in England specifically. That's our home and it suits my introverted feeling because for some reason I just feel like <laughs> I'm in my element, especially um, when I don't stay in the city or because we don't live in the city. But at the same time, I think this kind of this marriage has, has helped us in providing um, stability uh, in creating a very healthy relationship and environment which then helps uh, with constant travel and work because the re like the reality is that my my work is traveling and often that there is a blur line between that and having a, a clear distinction line between personal life and work helps me tremendously and I can't say that I am sad that I'm married as if that my freedom's gone because it's completely the opposite. I'm just so very happy. And Dave and I are so very happy to have found each other. Um, yes, 
having a home base and having that strong foundation and stability helps in creating more creative work, I suppose, because living nomadically was interesting and definitely was also challenging, especially with an, an Indonesian passport. There were so many red tapes I had to go through and doing this as a full time job makes it even more harder. Uh, and also when I'm not earning enough money, it's also difficult to find countries that would be able to benefit me in that way because I can't afford living on a day to day basis by moving a lot so much. But by having a home base, having a consistent relationship with people, it also changed my perspective in the way that uh, life is also fun to have a hobby. You know what I mean? When my life is my work and traveling is my job, but also is my life, I don't have a hobby. I didn't have a hobby, do you know? So I think if you ask any other travel creator, it would be hard for them to think, okay, what is my hobby? <laughs> um, so yeah, I appreciate this little joy that I found on day-to-day -day basis, I think, since um, having a home base. Coming from Ra Raven, Raven, Raven Dario. Do you plan on doing a lot of group tours soon? You just announced your group tour for Pakistan and unfortunately I cannot participate, but in the future I would like to meet other travelers like, like you in that kind of travel. Good question, because a few weeks ago I've announced my group tour to Pakistan for August 2023. However, due to unforeseen family obligations, we had to postpone that trip to 2024, but it will still be happening. So if you're not able to make it uh, to this year, please make sure that you sign up to the website that uh, we have regarding to this tour so that you can be notified when the tours happen because I still think that this is something I would really like to do starting to actually meet some of you in person um, and do tours together like trip together I think it's an uncharted territory for me and it's the opposite of what I would like to do being an introverted person but I would like to also come I would like to also uh, try new experiences, which means this is also part of it, if that makes sense. The next question is regarding to financing my travel. How do bloggers fund their trip? How do you sustain traveling for a year or more without working? And whether I do extra work to afford my travel and whether can I afford it alone from YouTube? Well, the reality is First of all, of course, YouTube is my job. So I've started doing YouTube in 2016. It was a part time thing that I was doing on top of the job that I was doing at the time. I just moved to China um, doing an English teaching job. Prior to that, I was working uh, in a governmental job, working with, uh, I think, the US governmental body with Indonesian governmental body and I saved up enough money for that but that saving was only able to sustain me for a few months even though I was also doing like volunteering and here and there and then I was moving to China to also earn more money um, doing YouTube part-time so then in between there is always that um, baseline that I can uh, come back to because I was also worried to have zero <laughs> money in my, my account because I think it made me feel anxious. So what I did was that uh, I did stay with a lot of locals and also I was earning money from an actual job. YouTube did not become my full-time job only until 20. 2018 when I was in Nepal um, actually it was after I left China and I thought I think I really want to go back to traveling again and the only way the closest thing that I can do to sustain this lifestyle is actually creating videos on YouTube and long and behold it becomes a job that I have now can I sustain that alone um, I actually think it's it's a difficult question to answer because obviously for me personally, 
I don't earn as much as you would think as a YouTuber. I think because coming from where I'm from, the demographic audience uh, of where I'm where, where I have, uh, despite the large numbers of some of the videos, YouTube still don't have ads in some of the countries. Uh, and also YouTube ads vary differently. For example, if I have a video that has so many views, but coming from Asian countries in terms of the audience, the ads means nothing, little to nothing. It's like $2 per a thousand views, you know? And sustaining traveling from that money is rather difficult because traveling is becoming more and more expensive. So what I do is basically saving up my income each month on top of Patreon income as well. Um, that's how my supplement income helps. But at the same time, I basically don't get paid for the time that I spend on um, traveling itself or even editing now that I also have an editor myself, um, a friend, Jordan, he is watching now. So yeah, I think the reality is I don't have any other job to sustain this, but at the same time, it's like a, another business. You put money into it in the hope that uh, you will make a profit from doing this thing that you do. It's basically like any other business uh, that people do, right? And often the time, often times, if it's a good month, you'll make profit. If it's a bad month, you are losing money, like what I'm currently experiencing with my Caucasus region, the amount of production expenses and the amount of money that this videos earn me is just so heartbreaking um, but also at the same time there is month there are months that I'm break even and that's a good month so you just I don't know I think it's not for everyone definitely uh, if you want to do this this kind of job next I don't know how long have I been talking I'm a bit worried that it's just going to be like blabbering so the next questions are mostly personal questions and some of you <laughs> are so nosy okay but here you are um, where are your family and how is your relationship with your parents hope someday you include them in your vlog so my family are in Indonesia my parents and my brother my relationship with them are great. We communicate uh, regularly on video chats, on chat and keeping each other's up to date. I don't actually include them in the vlog. Or I just like my, my current family, obviously now that I have a family in England, my husband's family, they are also my family. I personally don't include them in the vlog, but I actually do that for Patreon purpose patreon only vlog and these are more intimate personal and a platform i feel comfortable sharing whereas on a public situation like this i don't feel comfortable because i think there is a clear separation between the travel that i do for work which are this travel videos at the same time having an actual time with my family which i rarely have so when i spend time with them I actually just spend time with them and be present with that so yeah and the next one being several people asking whether i'm married which is interesting yes i am married last year in june 2022 in england dave and i got married um in the summer yeah june is summer <laughs> sorry uh, yeah, it was such a beautiful day. We were surrounded by the people we love and people who were willing to spend the time with us. It was it was such an experience, you know, for me because I didn't know I didn't know what to expect, but I was very happy. So so very happy. Mm. This is from Satri Aji Wibowo. A question that has one of the most like, which means that so many people are also interested in this question. How did I meet David? So if you don't know, Dave is my husband. We met through Nepal videos, if I can say that. So in 2018, 
we traveled to Nepal separately and at different time and I was making travel videos of, from Nepal and I think he found that on YouTube and found me on Instagram and according to him okay I don't know if he agrees to this but he liked not <laughs> I knew he was he liked so many of my Instagram photos so that I could notice him and then when I noticed him I thought oh interesting Dave W films and I thought oh this person is involved in filmmaking and at the time I was so curious about you know how to make better travel videos and uh, yeah I actually sent him a, a message probably that's my pickup line <laughs> saying like oh you know like because I was watching his videos and I thought you're what is it camera no your microphone is really good the sound is really clear what microphone did you use and then you know after that a week of chatting the rest is history um, we actually maintain a long distance relationship for three years and then uh, actually yesterday it was our it was our fourth year anniversary and yeah we just got married last year and uh, very very happy to be with each other just happy to have found your own person that's also something that you develop it's not like a relationship that was given to you because we really work hard for this um, and it's something that we always nurture for this relationship to grow stronger okay the next one so many people asking whether I will get a British passport whether I will leave my Indonesian citizenship and whether I have a British passport the answer to that first question will I get a British passport yes but simply just because I'm married to a British person doesn't mean that I am naturally changing my nationality I have a UK residence permit but it doesn't mean that I am changing my citizenship yet because it's a long five-year journey and a lot of um, documents we have to go through and also a test that eventually I have to do um, that require a lot of knowledge about not only the UK but histor history. I don't think anyone in England, in Scotland, in Wales or Northern Ireland will know the answer about so this citizenship is still, um, I think at the moment, four years to go for us to go through. Yeah, um, until then, I'm still holding an Indonesian passport. That's uh, the question. The second being whether I will leave my Indonesian, Indonesian citizenship. The answer is yes, because Indonesia doesn't acknowledge dual citizenship. And second being, I think it's a lot easier for me to just have a the citizenship where I will live permanently um, because I've left Indonesia in 2016 and it was a good decision that I've chosen because I knew that I will not live in Indonesia permanently um, but yeah apart from that I still have Indonesian passport <laughs> Uh, which then tells whether I have a British passport? The answer is no. Okay. Uh, someone asked Agata Strunzova, will I ever moving uh, to Scotland or consider moving to Scotland? The answer is yes. Uh, my husband and I have been in discussion of, you know, like we are not tied down to any particular place or we don't have any mortgage yet we are renting a house now currently so there's a lot of possibilities for us to probably stay somewhere different and we would like to experience that we would like to always experiment and I think that's the beauty of our relationship because I just remember before meeting him I just want to be with someone who also creates and thankfully he is also in the creative you know industry um, Personally, he comes from a musical family background, and 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 he is his family uh, half Scottish. So there is that idea that we would love to move to Scotland for that purpose. Um, just d different family in England, in Scotland, and just to get different experiences living in uh, this environment. That would be that would be very 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 lovely because I always feel like. I feel at home in Scotland uh, and that is a nice feeling not that I don't feel at home in England but I think it's a lot more like 
I, I vibe with the Scottish humor as well and banter. I love the English humor. I love the Scottish humor. I love the, the banter between this, you know, just as fun. It's so fun. Uh, the last question, and this would probably be one of the most question people ask over the years that I don't personally answer on a video. The, the, the fact being whether I'm still a Muslim, why did I leave Islam and why did I remove hijab? So if you don't know, I started my YouTube when I was still wearing a head cover and at the time I was still a practicing Muslim. I grew up in a, Mus uh, in a Muslim environment. I grew up to a Muslim parents and in 2017 basically I no longer associate myself with that. I basically consider myself an ex-Muslim and I think in if, I, if you ask me like why especially like up until to this point there are so many I'll tell you just the amount of comments people judging hating preaching saying that what I've done is wrong and like my choices in life is like how could you leave this religion it doesn't matter you know it doesn't matter because for me this is my conscious decision to leave a religion that I do not associate myself with. Um, Dave and I basically do not practice any religious belief. We got married a civil wedding, which means there is no religion part attached to it. Um, I personally met him when I've left Islam and he also left church a long time ago. And we also bonded over that, like coming out of um, religion is also hard. Um, especially if you grew up in a more religious society. So for me personally, irrespective of my personal decision, whatever choices and why, you know, it doesn't matter because I can tell you that I'm in much better, in a much better place, much happier with my decision because leaving such religion is a huge, huge task. Um, takes a lot of courage, takes a lot of um, mental strength and it's not an easy journey. It's a lot easier to convert to certain religion but not to leave a religion and this is not talked about very much, okay? And I think, I thank my past self for taking that journey, not knowing what it would be like, you know, because it was scary to rebuild your identity from the identity, the only identity that I knew back then, because that's the only identity I knew. And reconstructing the, like my whole understanding of the world, my whole understanding of myself, not being tied down to a certain dogma, certain teaching, or any sort of association to any religious belief is just so liberating. And I think with traveling, it helps me. Then again, it comes back to my sense of neutralness. I just don't feel associated or attached to any sort of specific identity, um, especially a specific religious uh, belief system. And I think it just, if you can't tell, I'm in like it, it's, it's been, it's been great. It's been great. It's been hard but it's been rewarding because the hardest path, the hardest path that I've taken is coming forward and being truthful to myself that this is not something I can relate to. This is not something that I want to follow. This is not something that I agree with. Um, and irrespective of whatever people say, I don't care because it's my life and I'm the one who's living this life. And I tell you what, when you don't take everyone's opinion to be your decision making, it's so liberating. The unlearning process of choosing the path and carving out, carving out your own path is hard, but extremely rewarding. And it takes a lot of, again, courage, inner strength within yourself. And if you're not ready to be honest with yourself, it will be hard as well because it takes some time to get through that and years and years of healing. So, which 
whichever path that you're on, um, I am just hoping that you are having the strength within yourself to go through this um, because we are all just living our best life, isn't it? And I think I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for the path that I've taken um, and for the future journey that I will be embarking. Um, I don't know if this makes sense because it's never been a black and white answer. It's a gray area and uh, what I'm happy about is just I stand on my ground and whatever that you say on the comment section, it will not bother me. So yeah, I think that's the last question. Also, I need to say that people from Nepal, Nepali, <laughs> So many of them asking when will I be coming back to Nepal and the answer is I don't know, okay? I was there five years ago. I was there for over a year and a half, I think. Even during pandemic, I was in Nepal and I've made so many Nepal videos, even when there was no AdSense in Nepal. So actually those videos did not earn me money. Uh, but I must say your dedication, Nepali, like hands down, it was... <laughs> It's very charming, but thank you so much for your support. So I also would like to uh, mention that if you like this video, please let me know what you think about this. And also, please also make sure my, now I have activated my Instagram again. So check it out and specifically Patreon. If you want to support a creator like me and my work, it will be so very lovely. I cannot wait to present to you the Central Asia travel series. I'm hoping to be able to show the best of my ability this this interesting region right uh but yeah other than that thank you so much again for your support for your lovely comments see you again next time on the next video bye